I imagine like, uh, like a lot of uh, audio engineer types did. I'm a musician, I started off playing in bands. I'm a guitar player, it's my first love. Um, ignorant rock musician. Um, and so I just got into recording, you know, and when we were in the, we did our first albums in big studios, we did it on two inch tape, and I was just fascinated by the process. I was like usually the first one there in the studio, the last one to leave, and I think I would drive the engineer crazy, asking him, you know, what does this do? What are all these lights and buttons and knobs? What are they doing? And I just, I just found myself really drawn to the process, although I didn't really understand what was happening. I just knew what I wanted our recordings to sound like. And that kind of sparked my interest. And then I think when digital technology came of age and it lowered the price point of entry for people to get into recording that was, you know, actually really high quality. Although I did have a couple of quarter inch like Tascam reel to reel recorders. I monkeyed around with those and I even had a four track and I think I still have it here somewhere that for like a cassette tape, you know, because mm -hmm. um, I kept it for sentimental reasons. But, um, but yeah, when, I, when digital recording kind of came of age, I just kind of got into it and I like, I think I went to Guitar Center and bought a two channel PreSonus audio interface and it came with a copy of Cubase on a CD-ROM. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is dating myself here. Yeah. Um, and so I loaded it in my computer and I was like, oh, this is cool. And so I just kind of monkeyed with like acoustic guitar for a long time and I just started doing like just kind of like just instrumental stuff, soundtrack type stuff. And I realized, hey, this is interesting and I'm finding it fa the process fascinating. And then, you know, it just kind of went on from there. I just, I started recording more and more stuff. And then my friends were like, hey, could you record me and my guitar and I was like sure and first it was just for fun I was just learning you know because I didn't mm -hmm. know what I was doing I yeah. was figuring out by doing it you know um, but I always trusted my ear and uh, and I, I let that guide me in the process and then it just kind of I just got you know how it goes you just fall down the rabbit hole and you're just like well let me buy this microphone for a hundred bucks and then you use it for a while and then you're like well, I'm sell it and then buy one that's two hundred dollars and then sell it buy one that's four and so it just but in the process, I think that's how I learned just by doing, I mean, making good recording is the only way to do that is to make really bad recordings for a long time and then mm -hmm. learn from the process. So I think it was a natural progression for me. I still consider myself a guitarist and a producer first and foremost, but I got into recording and I think, like I said, they're, I think like a lot of people who are in this business, they're both, they're musicians and they understand how music works. And some lean more to the engineering side, some lean more to the producer side, and then there's the musicians, and it's kind of like a community. So, I don't know, it was just kind of a natural evolution for me. So how did you come up with the, the name Cafe Solo? Cafe Solo, well, you know, it's interesting because um, the word, you know, in Spain, Cafe Solo is... I, it's a drink. It's like if you go into a bar and ask for a cafe solo, it's just black coffee. And so I liked the, uh, and that's what I, one of my favorite drinks is just black coffee. And uh, also the name solo has like a musical connotation as well. So I just decided to, to call the studio Cafe Solo Studios. All right, cool. Uh, tell me a little bit about your setup here. Were you were you a uh, Mac guy, P PC guy? <clears throat> I'm a Mac guy, um, and I'm like, it's not a moral issue for me. It's not an emotional <laughs> issue for me. I don't care. You know, I work with all types of people and work with all types of studios, sending stuff back and forth. But I learned, you know, 20 years ago how to use a Mac, and that's just by default, just what I gravitate towards. So. Um, I'm running a Mac system here and Pro Tools. Um, I'm actually running, everything is running off this Mac Mini, uh, Mac believe Mini. it or not. It's like a couple of years, I had like a big tower and then a couple of years ago I sold, I got rid of it because it was basically, you know, you need to realize after a while you're, you just can't upgrade your computer anymore. It won't run yeah. the latest OS. So yeah. you just kind of have to give in, which is I'm sure part of Apple's business plan and it works. But anyway, <laughs> so I got the Mini and I'm real happy with that. I think it has, it doesn't have the M1 chip, it has the last Intel chip, I think that was in it, and I think it has 32 gigs of RAM, like a one terabyte, you know, system drive, which is what I record onto, and then I archive and backup stuff to all sorts of external drives. But yeah, that's the computer, then I just have this, you know, cataract sized display window <laughs> so I can kind of see what I'm doing, because yeah. the older I get, the bigger I need the screen to be, so. But yeah, it's a Pro Tools system, basically. Yeah, and digging the, the lava lamps. Yes, I mean, uh, it's a requirement, I think, you know. Uh, I don't know of any studio that doesn't have some sort of, and they're everywhere. There's a couple in here, there's one in there. I love, yeah, I love me some. Anything, well, I'm just like, look, I'm going to be in here all day long, sitting and doing the same thing over and over again. And so the space for me 
has to be inspiring. You know what I mean? Like, it, yeah. it can't look like a dentist office. That's yeah. not inspiring to me. Nothing yeah. against dentists, but you know, <laughs> it, the space itself, it has to be practical, like zero function in terms of the room being built right so that I can hear what I need to hear, but also it needs to be like aesthetically pleasing. Aesthetics are a big deal to me. So, I, and also I think it helps artists when they come in here and they feel like, oh, okay, this is a place they associate, this is a place I can be creative. This is what yeah. this is for. Yeah. And so hopefully it kind of stirs their creativity as well. Cool, cool. Let's go through your, uh, your, I guess your chain thing. here. Yeah, okay. So I have basically like a, a snake in the tracking room and everything goes from most of the, just about, and all the channels go start in there and they go through the wall and then there's a few more channels that are just directly in here. And the other thing goes to the, the Aurora is what's doing most of the conversion. That's what I'm clocking off of. So it's a 16 channel, you know, um, ADDA converter. Then I'm also have looked, hooked up the, uh, the Universal Audio Apollo as well. So they kind of like Voltron somewhere in the back in this chassis. So I have 16 channels from the, the Aurora and then the Apollo has four more mic preamps in it and then four more, I think, line in. That's an eight. Yeah, it's just, a, it's an eight. So there's eight channels total. So I have basically about 24 channels I can work with, and which is, you know, I've never run out of channels in terms of tracking. And then that basically, you know, goes to the computer and then I have the patch bay. Everything here is in the, the patch bay. So the main, like I have, mo these are mostly preamps. You know, I have some 500 series stuff here. Mm -hmm. um, Sabatron, this is a great unit by a company in Australia. It's a four channel tube preamp, which I love. It sounds wonderful. I like on acoustic guitars and stringed instruments. I use it all the time for that, even drum overheads. The main vocal chain is most often, and again, everything I say could be prefaced with, well, it depends on the, you know, because that's, you know, <laughs> yeah. no matter what it is, yeah. just so just assume that has been inserted before everything I say in terms of what do you like to use. But in general, the main vocal chain is the Neve 1073 and the Neve compressor. Um, and then often I will bring in, if I need to, like this warm, you know, just kind of their, their Pultec equivalent. Um, Another, a lot of stuff that gets used as well as the API stuff. These two 512s are they're wired into these EQs, so I'll use those a lot on kick and snare. It's another four channels of API. Ventec is great. He makes a lot of like Neve clone type stuff, so that's like a 1272, I think, is the model. Oh. Dual 72, yeah. Um, I have a couple of like, I put this in here so I could access the Ventec and so the couple of Subatron channels from in here, so they're wired in the back. Um, and the rest is just like, this is a, just a, an old like art, you know, two channel input that I probably use for talk back in the room or room mics. Mm -hmm. But uh, then I have, like I said, the Warren Pultec here. This, this uh, Audioscape is a really great company. I've just reached, uh, a friend of mine turned me on to them. Um, <clears throat> they make really just awesome compressors and EQs. That's their 1176D. Yeah, I see that. And uh, I love it. I use it a lot on, on bass guitar, on acoustic guitar even, uh, room mics, and uh, yeah, I mean, so th this is basically the bulk of the of the outboard section. Um, I monitor, I send everything out through the other end of the snake, through this little, this Presonus uh, mixer, so everything goes into there and then into the snake. And uh, that way I can, it's kind of nice because I can, I can pl plug my, my headphones into here and I can listen to their mix first and kind of do a mix for the artist. And I can do, I think, six mixes, listen to that, then send it to them. And then usually I can get it pretty close to what they want to hear. Because sometimes they know exactly what they want to hear. Sometimes they don't know what they want to hear. Yeah. They're newer in the studio. So <laughs> I kind of like give them a pre pre prab you know, mix and then send it to them. And then they can control their master volume in there. So that's how I monitor everything. This is a lot of it go in... Uh, during tracking or is it for mixing a little I use, bit of both yeah I mean I use most of this during tracking because I think one of my early days of recording like when I was just starting off I was just like okay let me just try to let me just make sure I don't clip you know and that's yeah. that's yeah. no matter what it sounds like let me just make sure I get something recorded that is that is usable mm -hmm. and then I'll fix it in the mixing process which of course is a horrible way to go yeah. about <laughs> recording because when you have a bad source material it, all the plugins in the world aren't going to fix that so I've since changed long ago my philosophy to get the best possible usable sound that I can get 
on the front end so that I'm not trying to fix things when I'm mixing because yeah. to me that's a very demoralizing process and also it's not very efficient so now I will go out there and just move the microphone you know or yeah. go you know what let's just try a different amp that amp is just too bright for this tone or let's try a different vocal mic you know because you know, you have, I've built plenty of vocal mics, but not every vocal mic sounds great on every singer because everybody's different. Yep. So I try to use the outboard gear, my approach is to, get, to sculpt the sound and get it as close to what we're wanting to hear. So that when I give a client a rub, it's like, okay, we're, we're in the ballpark. Like we know what needs to happen. We need to tweak a few things. Maybe it's just a matter of balancing and an EQ here and there. <clears throat> but this is kind of the, the organic tones are really solid. So I can use, you know, I do, and sometimes reamp, you know, uh, guitars and basses, and I can run stuff through the outboard again, gear again if I want to do that, but I'm mostly using it for uh, tracking. Okay, and uh, let's go to the monitors. What do we got here? So <clears throat> I've gone through several sets of monitors, and of course, anybody who's been in a studio for a minute will recognize these as mm -hmm. Yamaha and S10s. And I finally settled on these. I've had a lot of really, and I probably will add another pair of like full range speakers. I had some Focal um, Shape 65s for a while. I had some Dyna Audios for a while. And I just, I keep, I keep just hopping around trying to figure out, I don't know what I'm looking for. I think I just, sometimes I need something different to get inspired maybe or to challenge my, myself. But mm -hmm. I finally settled on these because as anybody knows, they're, they're wonderfully awful. Um, because <laughs> yeah. they're just, they just sound, they're just kind of harsh and they just, it, but if you can get your mixes to sound good on them, they're pretty true in terms of getting the mid range right and getting uh, just things to sit well in a mix. So I mainly mix on those. I do have a sub down there that I can bring in and out. And I also monitor through this little um, Oritone, like one from the seventies. I hate to have a stereo match for it. I just, it's in the storage. I just use that and I run a mono signal to it because basically, I mean, I'm mostly mixing in mono anyway, but I run that, you know, I, I basically AB between the NS10s and that. And then I'll take out, you know, maybe some, some of my high fidelity headphones just to hear things, to make sure there's not it's something weird going on, in, you know, high up in the frequencies like reverb trails and stuff like that. But uh, I mainly mix in on NS10s. I'm happy with what I'm, I'm getting so far. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. And then you're using the dangerous for the yeah the dangerous so this is basically yeah this is what I'm what everything is routed this is great because it's um, allows me to switch between the two speakers or take this up in or take it out um, mono everything um, you can put like someone comes and hey I have a demo can we listen to it I can plug it in the back there's a, there's a couple of other inputs so I can just I can have another input on it and it's it's totally passive and it doesn't color the sound whatsoever and the, the, the fidelity is really really amazing um yeah i had another cheaper monitor station type thing and it was fine but then i used the dangerous stuff and i was like wow i can really like the sound field really really became transparent to me after using that so i'm real happy with that cool yeah yeah, yeah so this isn't a massive control room uh <clears throat> so like a lot of people i i battle containing the low end and making sense of it, which is harder, harder, obviously in a smaller room. It's not a tiny room, but it's not massive. So the low end was an issue. And so for a while I was just kind of putting some basic, you know, absorption and diffusion in here. And I was still having a hard time hearing the low end clearly. So I called up GIK Acoustics, which is a wonderful company. I think they're based in Atlanta and they have a, a European office as well. And I just sent them my diagrams of my room and what I had, and they were great. They're really um, helpful over the phone, and they told me what to get, and they were right. So I basically put a lot of bass trapping on the back wall. As you can see, there's four really massive panels of bass trapping. That, man, that made a huge difference in controlling the bass, absorbing it, and flattening out the room. And I replaced the side panels with some much thicker ones that go down to uh, lower frequencies to trap some of the low mid frequencies and then some diffusers kind of on the back walls there um, and yeah I mean the room is not absolutely perfect but it's 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 a, it's as flat as I've ever gotten it and when I walk around the room now and listen to things it's pretty pretty balanced all the way around for one I've kind of learned the room you know what because I, I know what I'm hearing but mm -hmm. this uh, I really am happy with all the GIK stuff it really has taken this room and, and like I said, flatten things out to make it so that what I'm hearing here is what is there and I'm not hearing, you know, reflections and, and frequencies, weird frequencies build up and here and there. So yeah, I'm really happy with it. Very nice, very nice. You wanna go check out the, uh, the live room, I guess? I yeah, sure.
Yeah, so uh, this is the live room. This is the main tracking room. Obviously, this is where I do, you know, most, you know, loud things like drums, um, loud guitar amps, and um, I've, I'm constantly working in this room as well, trying to get a balance between having it sound live so that instruments sound natural in here, but not too live so that, you know, the reverb trails or, or reflections are out of control. And it's something, like I said, I'll probably work on until I'm dead. But I'm happy with what I have so far. And uh, it's big enough, like as you can see, it's big enough to put a band in here. I mean, you can get easily get five, six people in here and, and have plenty of room. Um, and here is like the, uh, I, that's basically, a, 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 it serves as an ISO booth. Uh, we can put amps in here if we really need to like separate something from the like if we're tracking things live you want as much separation as possible to have you know but without but not too much so that everything feels weird or robotic or isolated or too isolated but a lot of times we'll put loud guitar amps in here and put the musicians in the tracking room uh, it's also a dead room so if i just want a completely dead vocal or a dead acoustic guitar or a dead drum sound. I mean, I put drum kits in there as well. It's big mm -hmm. enough to do it, to have that. And then there's some other pockets in the studio, like this little hallway to the control where we can put more amps. I also have another hallway, like a like a storage down the hall, where we can isolate amps as well. So, but yeah, this is the main room. This is where <clears throat> most of the the musicians are. I also do vocals in here. As because I like the sound of this room, and sometimes it's kind of cool to have a little bit of like a room sound on the vocal. Um, again, just as I said, for depending on what we're doing, um, and depending on the client and the genre, and uh, and what we're going for. If we want just like a, a roomy, like live feel, then we'll do everything in here and we'll do it live. But if we want something where we want to meticulously do things, you know, step by step and make it sound super tight and produced, then we'll we'll do it that way. And the studio is really set up to do whatever you want. Right. And then uh, you have all these instruments available for everybody to use, right? Yeah, everything you see here is is mine. You know, um, you go every, through the amps real quick. Or yeah, so <laughs> start I, with amps. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I take that back. There's one amp. This there's a Corgera AC30 that belongs to a good friend of mine, um, but he left it here and said I can use it, and that sounds great. And that's his also his JCM 800. Um, which, of course, is an amazing rock amp. I'm a guitarist, as you can probably tell, by yeah, the amp, amp because I just love guitar. So there's uh, that's my Morgan Dual 40, which is kind of like a kind of like an AC30 circuit. Um, it kind of has a there's no master volume in it, but it sounds great, clean. Sounds great if you if you crank it up. Um, it gets used a lot. I play the Friedman Mini, uh, Dirty Shirley Mini quite a bit. That is an amazing amp. It has so many sounds in it. It can do like really kind of tweed sounding stuff if you put this little toggle in the middle. Um, but it can get super hard rock like JCM 800 or heavier um, if you turn it down. But it, it's, and it cleans up really well based upon your guitar's volume knob. It, it really, I mean, I, if I had one amp that I had to do like a bunch of projects with, I'd probably pick that one because it's so versatile. But I mean, yeah. all the amps, you know, get used. And of course the Soldano is, I mean, probably one of the best high gain amps ever made and that's for getting your metal on or but i used it actually on this pop tune and if you i mean it's kind of a two channel amp it has a lot of sounds in it other than just heavy heavy rock it's got a really nice overdrive and really it's got a lot of headroom it's only the 30 watt version um mm -hmm. which makes it a little more manageable maybe than the 100 watt I'm, i don't know i've never owned a 100 watt but i mean the 30 watt is plenty loud but Gosh, just it's so articulate when you hit a chord and you let it ring and you pick the strings and you can hear everything because there's yeah. no mud, there's no mush in it whatsoever. It's super accurate. Yeah, I've got a little Jet City 20 mm. watt amp that Solano mm -hmm. helped me. That's right, it's the same kind. Yeah, and, uh, it's uh, no, they're amazing. The cleans are amazing. On they're that they're one, amazing. Sure. So, so yeah, that's my that that's those are my amps and the little Supro actually over here. I, that's kind of oh. it's kind of hiding. A little hidden away. This is fun. <laughs> yeah, I found this on Craigslist, like in mint condition, and it sounds great. Wow, it's just the it's not the Black Magic. Is it? It's a 1600 Supreme. It's got two channels, and yeah, I love it. It's got it's just really warm. And the louder you turn, and I think it's only like a 10 or 15 watt amp, but the louder you turn it up, the better it sounds. It gets used a lot for clean stuff and it really takes pedals well. Like a lot of okay. like alternative or worship guys love to use it because it takes pedals really well. All right, and then uh, let's go through drums. How do you have it all mic'd up? What do you got? So this is just, uh, I was just monkeying around. This is the main kit. This is a Yamaha uh, Maple Custom Absolute that I found on Facebook Marketplace. Like.
three or four years ago for so cheap. I thought I thought it was a joke. I thought the guy was like <laughs> just playing with me. Maybe he didn't know what he had. And yeah, and he's like, no, I know what it is. I just don't want to be. St I don't want to be stingy. I just want to. I want someone to use it. I'm like, well, I, I run this studio, and I can guarantee you it get used a lot. So I drove up to Tulsa, I think it was, and and picked it up from him. So yeah, there's. It's got like I think it's a 10, 12, 14, and 16 tom, and then a 22 kick. And this is a typical like kind of big rock drum kit sound, like mic setup. I mean, everything's moved around, so it's probably not a position perfectly. Oh, that's fine. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I use, you know, 57 on snare and usually a, like a 451 as well. And um, 421s on the toms usually. Um, for this session, I was using the, the, K, the KM184s for overheads, but also the coals really sound great because they're so fat. So I kind of put that up there just to get sound of the body of the drum kit and the snare. And then the 184s to get cymbals and just, just to also to give myself options. And then of course I'll set up some room mics. I love ribbon mics. And so I'll set up the coals for room mics or I'll set up that the R44, the big ribbon and the ISO booth as a room mic because it sounds great on everything. Or I have a Royer 122. That's a, I just love the way ribbon mics sound and how they capture sound differently than other microphones, especially as, yeah. as in a live room. So, but yeah, that's kind of how I have things set up, you know, and of course there's plenty of guitars for anyone who's <laughs> interested, you know, I never... Any uh, ones that stick out to you the most? Well, there's two acoustics in the other room that I love, but it probably... Yeah, I want to get to that one. Oh, okay. Uh, I saw the Instagram post. Today. Oh, okay. Um, this, I probably, I mean, there's so many... This is a 95 Les Paul Classic that I bought new in 95. And oh, it's wow. probably, I don't know I don't know if I have sentimental, I do have sentimental attachments <laughs> to my instruments, but this is definitely one of my favorite guitars. I call it Tigger because of the stripes, the flame top kind of remind me of a tiger. And yeah, it's, it's seen a lot of shows, but it mostly stays in the studio right now. And my main gigging guitar is this PRS um, David Grissom model, DGT, uh, which David Grissom was just a fantastic guitarist uh, based in Austin, I believe. And this one has, as you can see, it's a lot of gigs, a lot of wear and tear. It's so versatile. These pickups are proprietary to the, this model, and they're kind of like slightly higher output, I think, PAFs, but you can tap the coil and get single coil sounds out of it. It just, it's so versatile that no matter what gig, it's probably the right guitar. But I mean, <laughs> this is the one I, I, I play most often live. Huge fan of PRS. Oh, they're, the build quality is just amazing. The intonation is great. I mean, they're always, they stay in tune and they just, they just consistently sound good night after night. And of course I have some other fun stuff like the American Tele. Um, it's an Epiphone Sheraton from like 94, 95 that I put, this is kind of fun guitar. Cause I didn't really have a semi hollow body guitar. I took, took out the pickups and put some Duesenberg um, pickups in it. So oh, you cool. have a humbucker here and kind of like a P90. Here's the one that's in there, whatever they call star player. I can't remember the model. I think that's it or close. Someone will correct me on the internet. Yeah. Um, and then it sounds great for like those just like hollow body type tones. Um, I love the sound of that guitar. There's a baritone guitar. That's fun. Is that the Dan Electro? That's the Dan Electro. Yeah. yeah, that's fun. That gets used like, I love the sound of that with like a tremolo effect. It really mm -hmm. sounds cool. I guarantee you not many studios have one of these. If you're a mandolin player, this is a Gibson tenor guitar. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, it's tuned like a mandolin, usually. Probably needs to be tuned. It's close. But yeah, this is great. This belonged to my mom, actually. And uh, she didn't really play anymore. And I took it to a, luth uh, a luthier just to have it set up and fixed because there was some damage to the finish on the back. And he's like, this is a tenor guitar. I'm like, well, what's that? I was like, well, it's a, it's kind of like a bluegrass instrument. It was got developed, it's probably in the 60s when this was made maybe early 70s i'm not sure someone will correct me i'm, I'm sure <laughs> um but it's great but yeah it's kind of like a, a lead instrument that was louder than a mandolin but more like had more of a tack and would cut through than, and then an acoustic guitar so it kind of was used often in, in bluegrass music so i'm told but it's really cool i use it a lot on any sort of acoustic pro uh, project because when you you know blend it in with like acoustic guitars it's just a completely different tone and yeah. it really sounds cool to kind of and especially if you're really good at playing mandolin or in that tuning then then you know what what you got and you can make it sound great these are some other odds and ends this is like i have this guitar this yamaha tuned to a nashville tuning yeah so like an octave higher mm -hmm. uh that's fun of course obligatory lava lamp gotta have a lava lamp and what is this oh this is kind of like a resonator kind of like 
I don't know what, this is like half acoustic, half banjo. It's got like a big drum in here, but it's cool. It's like really distinct sound, um, kind of folky, Americana, bluegrass-ish type uh, instrument. And of course here are basses. We've got a Music Man Sterling that gets used a lot on a lot of recordings. A couple of GNLs, um, which are which sound amazing as well. And then there's a, actually a Dean eight string eight bass string. because I love King's X because they're <laughs> one of my favorite bands. Yeah. And of course he really kind of he he and a few other guys popularized the eight string and twelve string bass. So, so you got a wall of snares over here. I do wall of snares. Yeah, um, my friend built this like uh, shelf for them, which I thought was cool. But yeah, we got the. I have the, and one of the other kits I have is a Gresh uh, Catalina Club kit. And so that's the snare that goes with this. Um, what is this? Not being a drummer, I know I'm gonna call these the wrong thing. Is this the Superphonic or the Afterlife? I don't know. Internet, you can correct me. I just know what it sounds like, okay? <laughs> Get off it. Yeah. Um, PDP, Platinum Series. Uh, this is, I think, maybe the Slinger one. Yeah, yeah, there we go, Slangerlin, yep. And then like that pork pipe there sounds great as well. It's 13, it's really deep. Um, great for just about anything. And the one that's on the kit right now is a Dallas drum uh, snare, which is also amazing. Most of those are mine. A couple of them belong to a, fr a friend of mine that just leaves them here and says I can use them. So thank you, Stephen, for that. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, what's your main vocal mics you are they in the yeah so i would say the uh the main vocal mic is probably a toss-up between the r44 because like i said it just sounds fantastic on on everything it's so smooth so warm um or a lot of times i will use i just have it in this case right now but i'll get it out for you If we're not using the R44, we're probably using this uh, Sound Deluxe U99. This is a this is made by David Bach, you know Bach Audio. This is an early one, um, not like the newer ones. And uh, this thing, it's a large diaphragm tube condenser. It sounds absolutely phenomenal. I changed out the tube and put a, a new old stock Telefunken tube in it, which really I mean it already sounded great, but when I replaced the tube, it like man, it really flattened out and smooth a lot of those high mid frequencies made things just there's no like bite or harshness to it anymore and it's just amazing it's great because it's got a on the power supply there's a variable polar pattern so you can switch it between cardioid and figure eight and, and all that fun stuff so this gets used quite a bit i just had it up on the shelf because i was cleaning up today so we'll use that it's usually that or the r44 um, i have used the coals as well on vocals um, they sound great and a lot of times it seems like last fall it was like all about the punk bands i did several <laughs> punk albums yeah and so the sm7 was definitely the way to go because they can just literally like physically almost assault the microphone and it's going to be fine they can handle it there's no way you, i mean you can't overload an sm7 at least i've never seen anyone do it and they they sound really great for like rock or gritty vocals so yeah i saw the uh hit in the cox live video yeah 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 they're i mean they're so great they're good friends and yeah Shout we, out did, to those guys. we did the, yeah they're amazing <laughs> they're such uh great musicians and such a great live band i love those guys um but yeah i did uh sloth fist and bullet machine uh, they're all friends, so yeah, and so I think on all of those albums for the vocals, I'm pretty sure. I think on Him and the Cox, I had a U87 at the time, I was using that, and then, but on the other two, we used the SM7, and yeah, we got we got great results. Cool. Uh, any other little odds and ends you want to show us? What about this piano here? Oh man, this piano is cool, you know, I, you know, being a guitar player, don't know how to play the piano, but when I listen to people come play, who actually know how to play the piano, it sounds great. It's it's loud, but it's very warm. It's very earthy sounding, and I, I love it. It gets used a lot, a lot on, on recordings. I usually just open up the lid and uh, kind of put some mics in here, or sometimes I pull it out in the room and put it behind the piano. So yeah, it's it's great. It's great. I love it. Okay, so you were asking me earlier, I mean, do I have any like prized possessions? And I'm like, well, you know. My children, uh, <laughs> but after that, probably yeah. This this is a 2000 Gibson J150 that I bought new in 2000, and uh, its name is Lulu. 
because I name all my guitars. Why? Because yeah, they, you, because it me. You know. We do that. We um, do that. <laughs> no, I just love this guitar. I think I tuned it to Dad Dad Gad Ryan. Yeah. yeah. You have no idea how good this sounds. It's, it's warm. <laughs> it's yeah. so amazing. It's not gonna pick up on these mics. But <laughs> no, but it means. Come to the studio and play it on the next yes, recording. Do that. I love that guitar. It just it gets used a lot on a lot of recordings because it's it's just so full and such a massive sounding uh, acoustic tone. Um, and then the and I love the J45. It's just like a workhorse um, guitar. Um, I was um, I was wanting something that was kind of diametric opposite of the J150. The J150 is has a lot of low end and a lot of top end because of the maple. And this is obviously a little bit darker. It does have plenty of top end, but it has a lot of warm and a low mids. And you know, it's a J45. Anybody's yeah. probably knows that they, and this one's a 2000, let's see, 2006. So this one's about, you know, 17, 16, 17 years old. And yeah, that gets, that gets played a lot, gets used a lot, you know, and but everything here, I mean, everything in the studio, I mean, all this gear, this is all mine or it's here. And anyone who comes here is welcome and encouraged to use anything because that's what it's for. I mean, this yeah. place is all, everything here serves a purpose to be, to foster creativity. And so if you have your own gear and it's awesome, great. But if you want to come in and use some mine or experiment or maybe come up with stuff because you get inspired playing something different, I mean, that's even better. So, yeah. that's the, but everything here is meant to be played and I encourage people to just have at it. Yeah, very nice. When COVID hit, you know, just like everybody else, you know, musicians and anybody in the entertainment business just had to figure out how to survive. And so sometimes I had to go and, you know, take side jobs just to keep the lights on. But fortunately, things are starting to come back. Live music is coming back. And so I'm my, most of my time is spent here. I also play guitar professionally for a country artist uh, from Houston named Gary Kyle, who's a wonderful musician, songwriter, and wonderful human being. Yes, sir. Um, and yeah, and then I also teach uh, recording and guitar as well. So between those three things, that's pretty much keeps me busy most of the time. Uh, I love I love being in Denton. I love the musician community uh, of Denton. That's one reason why I moved here in 2012. Um, the studio is a resource for the community, and there's nothing my, I enjoy more than collaborating with people and helping them realize their artistic vision for the music. And so, to me, the creative process, there's just nothing greater. And so, uh, I'm here, you know, I'm all over it, social media, on Instagram and Facebook, and my website is cafesolostudios.com. My phone number's on there. Text me, call me, email me. Come by and just check out the studio. I love meeting with people and figuring out where they're coming from and working with them to develop a plan to, to, to record their music and to help them, you know, capture like what's in here and what's in here, like down in audio so that every, so they can enjoy it and so their fans and their, their community can enjoy it. And to me, that's just, it's just the best job in the world and I love it. All right, Chris, well, thank you so much for having us over. Hey, thanks for coming by. I appreciate it's, it. It's great, yeah, I loved it. And uh, we'll see you next time. Sounds great. Thanks.